An important note before we start, this episode was recorded on the 9th of April 2021. This is when Shiv Malik was still a part of Streamer as head of growth. Now he's the CEO of Pool Foundation. Enjoy the episode. What has Web3 done to date, right? We've got money, digital money, right? That's Bitcoin. We've got contracts, really important. Um in with Ethereum. And we've got a way to trade and financialize all of that, right? That's that's the DEXs. What do NFTs represent in that schema? Uh assets, right? Well, you know, what are some other great assets? Well, you know, it's really hard to take a house and put that on the blockchain. It's really, really hard to do that. <laughs> but data is worth trillions and it's already digitally native, but it is stuck in web two. Voices of the Data Economy, a podcast supported by Ocean Protocol Foundation. We bring to you the voices shaping the data economy and challenging it at the same time. We talk about breaking down data silos and equalizing access to data for all. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Voices of the Data Economy. I'm here with Shiv Malik. Hey, Shiv. Hey, hi. How are you doing? Nice to see you. And Diksha, as always. Hey, Diksha. Hello, both of you. Hello. Uh, Shiv, I think we met uh, more than a year ago in Berlin during the Radical Exchange uh, Conference. I always wanted to have like this kind of conversation on a podcast, so it's great to see you here. Yeah, it was a great event, uh, that, that one in, in Berlin. It was like a year, yeah, a year and a half ago. Um, it, was just, it's a, it was a really intimate conference. There were some great connections to be made there. And uh, yeah. Really tight space. <laughs> it was hard a tight space. <laughs> yeah, it got very hot and sweaty very quickly. Um, but uh, I think the Trent was there, Vitalik was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's bathroom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Always, always amusing. Always amusing. Yes. Okay. So glad to know both of you already know each other, but very glad to meet you for the first time, Shiv. And uh, thank you for being a part of this episode. So you've been a former investigative journalist with Guardian, and now you're the head of growth at Streamer, uh, which is a decentralized platform for real-time data. Um, Actually, I'm really curious how you got into this world of data economy from journalism and what's really... What really inspired you to get into this movement of data privacy? So I've been asked this question a few times and I've never been able to answer it properly because I've actually never given it, I think, proper thought. Like, what is what is it like that actually motivated me? And, you know, post-event, everyone has this kind of post hoc rationalization, right? You're like, oh yeah, I did it because of this and that makes sense. But that usually isn't why it happened, right? Things are kind of serendipitous and... Yeah, things happen and you're like, oh yeah, sure. And, and, and it doesn't always make sense. So yeah, I kind of left The Guardian in 2016 and I was actually, I was researching a book on mutualism and cooperatives. And as part of that, someone said, have you, this is sort of, yeah, late 2016, you know, do you know anything about Ethereum? It's like, no. And uh, so they showed me, you know, smart contracting and, and the power of that. I knew about Bitcoin, obviously from being a journalist and the like, but never really got, a, got into it. But I fell in love with Ethereum because I suddenly realized, all oh, right, you can do all these things, right? You can just divvy up money in all sorts of interesting ways. And, uh, and actually, at, f- <laughs> at first I was like, oh, this is great because like all my transactions will be in one place. I can file my taxes so easily now. Uh, this is the future. <laughs> so yeah, uh, even at that level, I was in, in love with Ethereum. I was like, no more accountants. I'm sold. Um, sign me up. Um, but then there was this other, I think, I think deeper motivation for why I kind of ended up with Streamer and why I'm kind of doing what I'm doing now with data unions. And that's, you know, journalism, investigative journalism is about holding people to account, right? Holding power to account uh, and, and drilling down and exposing what can't otherwise be sort of uh, readily exposed, usually wrongdoing, right? Um, and I think that the Web3 space also does that very well. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and there's this weird other bit, which is that I'd always been interested in the data economy. In 2012, I was invited onto a new show to explain myself because I was deleting my Facebook account. Uh, it was such a weird thing to do in 2012. They're like, yeah, let's call Shiv on and, and you know, <laughs> trial by, uh, by, by kind of public media. Um, 
and I, and I, even then I was like, look, we've all, we're already becoming, uh, so at the time of Facebook's IPO, I said, we're becoming serfs, um, data serfs. And I, and I don't want to be a slave anymore. Uh, so that's why I'm deleting it. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be any richer of the fact that I am producing this value. So I've always had that. And then, so you marry all those things up and, you know, the journey starts to make sense, I guess. So you just mentioned data unions, and that's something that you've been speaking about a lot in the past and for the past one year rather to be more specific. And Streamer, I think, went live in June last year uh, with the beta version of data unions. So those who are not familiar, what actually is a data union and in the practical world, how does it really work? Yeah. So, I mean, I think most of your listeners will be really familiar with the fact that, you know, we all produced information and other people are harvesting that and profiting from it. And that seems inherently wrong. Uh, and there seems to be no way for ordinary people who are actually producing the value to, to actually retain any of that value themselves. So a data union is a way of um, pooling data between various parties and trying to monetize it as a collective, right? And that sounds really simple. That's just a really, really old idea. Like it's, it's I, you can find stuff going dating back to like the '90s for sure about how this should be done. And you know, and actually, if you pull it together, you'll still need an organization in the middle because actually, a lot of this stuff is about reaching out to data buyers. So you need to pick up a phone and speak to people, right? Machines can't do that yet. Yet. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not far off of that happening, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and you also need to be able to market yourself and attract new members so you can have more data, right, to this data union. So, uh, so that's the kind of model we went for. And it's one, you know, really well fleshed out by people like Jaron Lanier and Glenn Weil, um, who we mentioned in regards to, you know, radical exchange and that kind of thing. So they'd already kind of, lots of people have fleshed this out academically. No one's really done it practically. And it turns out when you try and do it in practice, there are some really like, big stumbling blocks. So that's what Streamer wanted to resolve. So what, what are the examples of data unions that are there on blockchain particularly? And um, I think some of you already have use cases and partners that have successful models around this. Mm. It's all, yeah, it's all starting to, to brew wonderfully uh, and, and take off. It's, it's uh, you know, that's the most exciting thing. Like I can remember in January, 2018, you know, we were sitting in the streamer office in Zouk and trying to come up with ideas, right? Like, okay, um, uh, how, how do we kind of, at heart, by the way, I should explain streamers initial uh, and still core aim is to create this peer-to-peer -peer net, uh, network for, for messaging, right? For peer-to-peer -peer messaging um, in a decentralized fashion. So we already have things that do that, like Amazon, uh, AWS services or UpCloud or whatever. But um, if you wanted to run it in a decentralized way, it's really difficult to do. It's the kind of thing that could power a smart city, for example. Um, and, uh, and one of the ideas that we came up with was obviously data unions. And, and you know, a few months after that kind of fleshed out this original uh, like diagram. I'm like, it should look like something like this, like just like with a pen and a ruler, like really, <laughs> really terrible wireframe drawing. The kind of the thing that I'm sure our designer looked at and just like, you know, facepalm. Um, <laughs> what Shiv done again. Um, but from that journey, we've now seen, I think, uh, four or five uh, data unions start to emanate. Uh, the most uh, prominent of which is Swash. It has 20,000 members now. Uh, and what is Swash? It's a browser plugin. So you download a, this plugin. It monitors your web browsing habits. Uh, and obviously you're consenting that because you're downloading it and you're getting the value returned right into the browser plugin. You've got a wallet set up, uh, it's Ethereum wallet address, and, uh, and you get paid uh, every time that data set sells. So 20,000 is a lot of people. Uh, I think they need to get to about 50,000 before they're like fully viable and they'll get buyers on board. A couple of other ideas. Uh, you can do the same thing. It turns out for Spotify, right? If you want to port your Spotify real-time stream of information, right? Not very privacy sensitive, so that's good. Port it to a pool of other people uh, and you have a, a data union that gives pe buyers like, you know, information on, on what people listen to, right? Podcasts and songs and playlists. Great. Uh, you know, that, that's stuff that Spotify doesn't sell at the moment. Uh, and then the music industry really wants to know. 
uh, Fitbit, you can do the same thing with your with your Fitbit or, or Withings in this case, because uh, they have an open API. Great, take that information and bring your health data. That's already been set up uh, by a wonderful developer called Chalil. Uh, um, and then there's another project that's uh, under the radar a little bit. Uh, actually, they're not, they're not, they don't have a Twitter account, so they, they tweeted. Uh, they're out in public, uh, called Unbanks. Uh, same thing with fran- financial uh, transaction data, right? The banks already sell this information. Uh, just they don't give you a cut of that, right? But you can easily pool it uh, yourself uh, through open banking infrastructure in Europe. Uh, so great, you have a widget, reads your third party. It's your data union. Uh, it reads your, your banking transaction details. It makes sure it's done in a really privacy-centric way so you can't be identified. But then you've got a whole pool of that information, which is, again, people will realize, oh, that's probably worth quite a lot of money. Great. Return that to the users. Um, if I could jump in here. Um, so m- all or most of these examples are data that is r- already being produced. And then uh, these data unions or efforts, they're kind of adding a monetization layer on top. Do you know of any... Um, examples that uh, data is primarily produced for the this use case of data unions to be monetized yeah so how did in are you asking this which is kind of how do data unions encourage data that yeah it just isn't really readily available to really be more yeah it's like is it, is it financially viable one day or for some use cases uh to generate data just for this so we're not quite there in having that uh, a, an actual example into the world yet, but um, we, we're trying, we're almost getting there, I think, with, with pollution monitors, right? So pollution monitors are really expensive uh, if you want to buy them kind of individually, like decent ones, uh, you know, kind of two, well, not really expensive, $200, right? Uh, or 100 plus dollars. <clears throat> but, you know, it's, it's, if suddenly if you add the feature that actually you could make this money back over time, then suddenly people go, ah, oh, right, okay. You know, I've got this and I've got this, you know, hopefully it won't cost $100. It'll cost me like something 20 over three years because I'll get the money back. That's the kind of thing that we were looking for. So suddenly people are like, okay, right, uh, you know, we'll have one pollution monitor per street. And suddenly you have really useful real-time information about what's going on. And people obviously, they care about their kids and they want to know, like, is it a good time to go and walk to school, right? Or not. And if it isn't, I want to complain to my council. And now I have the information to be able to do that. Right. And the same thing, by the way, it turns up in noise pollution. People who live next to airports, they have terrible time, right? Trying to like reduce that noise pollution. I mean, obviously for the last year, it's been an irrelevance, uh, but they all know it's coming back. And, and we, we've had people emailing us going, we want this system. Uh, and, and matching up the sensor maker with a data union is a little tricky, requires humans to talk, pick up the phone, um, but we're getting there. That's fascinating. So it's, it's almost like a, new revenue source for all of these IoT and like kind of machine data economy yeah. uh, tools that generate data, but maybe they need government subsidies right now. And this is a new way for uh, monetizing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, and then there's, there's other ways that you can think of, of there's a welter of ideas out there uh, that we've, we've kind of also had. Um, because you can imagine, you, you know, your phone, smartphones are amazing devices at collecting information. They have a whole load of internal sensors for a star, including obviously a camera, um, am- amongst anything, and noise devices. And as soon as you kind of allow those individuals to then, you know, all you have to do is create an app that collects a specific data set. And then you can imagine, okay, now there's a monetary incentive for people to do this. Then, 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 you know, that's how that takes off, right? And then you can imagine half a dozen ideas. I'm sure if we sat here for another five minutes, we could come up with them. Yeah. It's all, all to play for. And I think it's important to keep uh, them like uh, opt-in. It means like, I, I would imagine probably in countries like China or like Thailand where uh, data privacy regulations are not, or I don't think they're non-existent, but they're not as established as in Europe with GDPR you like handset makers, manufacturers, they might be selling phones in future that when you just start booting up your phone, you just agree to some terms and conditions. And one of the lines says, we're going to sell all of your sensor data for free and you don't get anything from it. I mean, this is what's happening now. 
and it's causing all sorts of problems. Um, the first one is obviously, you know, a lot of people are getting rich. Uh, uh, sorry, a s- tiny group of people are getting very rich off the back of everyone else. So that, that's one problem. The second problem is, and they also have a giant monopoly on the world's information, right? That's not great because uh, it's going to get worse. Uh, and that also stymies innovation. So, you know, why do we only have, like in most countries in the West, certainly, there's only one map application or two ways and Google maps, but actually they're owned by the same company. So that's what 21st century innovation has given us, one map app. You're like, that's rubbish. And like an Apple, but no one uses apples. Uh, so, and the reason for that is because they have uh, a monopoly on our location. We, we create that data, right? Um, uh, you know, I would like uh, other options, uh, but viable ones, right? So if you take the raw data sets away from them, anyone can build applications on top of the raw data sets. And that's, that's the world we want to live in. So, you know, there are all those problems. And then the most interesting problem is this. From the data bias perspective, this is terrible data. No one actually really wants this data, but it's the only data they can get, right? Why do you want to collect data under the table in a way that you're sort of spying on your users, that you buried the consent on page 70 of a contract that you know (laughs) no one's read? No one's read. Not even your lawyers have probably read it, right? And then no one's going to object to because they don't have time to like, you know, commission a lawyer and sit there for four hours to read the terms. No, no one does that, right? So you get data is just a byproduct now of our digital lives when actually you really want it to be the product. And that's what data unions do. You're like, okay, look, if you want to create good data products, get people to create the data who actually want to be part of this and like, and are happy to do it. Like, doesn't that make sense? And you think, oh, that sounds nice and fluffy. You're like, no. It creates better data products by far, like much richer, much more interesting, much more stable, much more sustainable data products. And and they're worth so much more. Then you can trust. And and when you pay for data, you can trust that your access is not going to be cut off. Whereas if you are building on top of Facebook or Google, like we know countless examples of startups getting their API access shut down just because Google felt, well, they're extracting more value from our ecosystem and closed garden than we would like to. Yeah, there's that problem. And then there's the other problem, which is that, um, so these data brokers go bust um, oh. all the time. We, you, you know, you kind of hear about it. Cambridge Analytica is the most famous, right? Yeah. Big data broker. They went bust, right? Pretty much overnight, like effectively. Uh, there was another one, Jumpshot, yeah. um, which went bust last year. Uh-huh. Uh, huge company, right? Well, for the data science world, like growing 30 million revenues, growing probably to 70 million, the kind of, you know, within the next year, that was a projection. Um, they had 400 people employed and literally within a week when they got uncovered by, I think it was Motherboard, uh, which was owned by Vice Magazine. Uh-huh. Uh, within one week, uh, their parent company shut them down. They're like, yeah, That's we, we can't handle this. And it's all about the ethics, nothing else. The business was great, like everything. All about the ethics. You're like, oh, we're spying. We can't spy on people. You're like, well, you knew you were doing that before. Th- this is uh, almost as severe as like when uh, there's like a news about a company in, I don't know, Southeast Asia using slave labor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I coined this data slavery. I did a... well. You were even involved. I'm not sure, but like there was some kind of podcast they, they invited me and, and then like my, my talking point was all about data slavery. And the, it is really like that. It, it, it's, it's slavery of your digital twin. I think, I mean, look, people object to slavery uh, being used and bandied around like that um, because of the kind of... Uh, the actual... Know, the, the, yeah, historic, right, the implications, yeah. historical implications of that and, and trivializing um, that historical experience. So I kind of end up using serfdom because uh, somehow we're less sensitive to the word serfdom. I'm sure people, uh, historians of 19th century really Russia might accept. But, but, it, it, but it is true. It's it the is same. Exploitation. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, and, it, and it's really overt. And one interesting thing that's just happened is in California. So Enoch Liang from DDP, which is the, the Data Dividend Project, um, supported and, and founded by uh, Andrew Yang, um, who people I'm sure will know. Uh, they have been fighting the legal good fight, if you want. Um, it's got to be fought by tech and in the courtroom. Uh, 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 and what they managed to get was a ruling from a California judge uh, in the last, I think, month. Uh, the case is called Calhoun, uh, if you're interested in, this, in, in, in looking it up, where the judge said, yeah, there is a natural property right to, to data. This stuff is worth something, and, yeah, and it's owned by the people who create it. Like, 
that just should follow. So, you know, more will emanate from that case. Uh, and, uh, you know, Americans, if America sets a standard for property rights in data, then I think that battle is won. And Europe, legislatively speaking, has <clears throat> struggled to, because of the way that the, the law is set up in continental systems, struggle to confer a property right of data onto people. But it's doing it a slightly different way, which is to basically legalize and, 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 and give stamps of approval to data cooperatives and a bunch of funding, two billion. So that's all happening in Europe now. So this is this is a huge scene that's about to take off. Wow! Uh, in Web three, so there's EU funding for data cooperatives. Yeah, yeah. Whoa! And what? What? There will be. Yeah, I mean they they've said two billion. So um, the, the pot of money gets unlocked soon, apparently. <laughs> what should people Google to find about find more about this? About about the EU funding? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, it was announced. I think about when was it? I, I'm getting confused whether it was, it wasn't November. It was yes, in January, I think, or January and February, um, the EU data strategy. And if you Google, I think, Vestager, who's the, um, the EU commissioner on this, um, you, you'll find the, the press release somewhere. They don't, they, they, they're not going to shout about it until, it's a little bit buried, but it is in the press release. Oh, um, okay. They're not going to shout about it until it's actually up and running. Um, okay. But it is, it will be, it will be match funding. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You're already putting in your application now. I, I can I can see you writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it'll be match funding uh, for you know people who have data cooperative ideas, um, which is great because wow. um, then it, it, you know whatever streamer or other organizations put into this, um, you know they'll get twice out. And 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 these ideas, some of them will fail, sure, but um, I think there's enough enough good ideas that you know a lot of them will start succeeding pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think you also mentioned as one of this, uh, the legislations and the grants as one of the biggest wins um, for data unions or to support data unions. And one of them is the example you already mentioned. So there are two parts to this question, sort of. Like, what are the other wins that you can think of apart from this? And geographically, which parts of the world do you feel are more receptive to a model like a data union? Or is it like borderless sort of? Nice question, Dikcha. Always the best questions. <laughs> I would say that in theory, uh, every government should be pro this, right? Because it, it does lend those two things. One, it's clearly giving monetary value to ordinary people and returning it back to ordinary people. Um, you know, as opposed to companies that are usually outside of their own country, right? Unless you're America. So that's always like a win, right? If you're in any way a democratic or populist government, great. You're like, that sounds nice. And also fair and just, right? It's part of some kind of natural justice train. Um, But it also opens up the innovation, right? So it's actually good for business. And, And the people who monopolize the data, they also know this too, right? But they can't help themselves from, from monopoly, from retaining their monopoly because of their shareholders. Uh, so, you know, I think there was a report in Britain that said if we did have full data portability, right, which is that people had the right to at least port their data to anywhere uh, and, you know, and you had the data cooperative model effectively built in, uh, it would add 27 billion uh, in pounds. So what is that? Off the top of my head, it's about 36, $36 billion in GDP each year. And, and uh, that's a lot. Uh, it's about 10 Ooh, it's about uh, five, five, ooh, yeah, five percent of what? Yeah, I, well, I should scrap that statement. I better not do the maths in my head and get it all horribly wrong. Um, but you know, that's this is a substantial amount of money uh, to to any country. So you know, uh, I, I think w- where it might not work, and I, I mean, you can also see it starting to take off in you know the is absolute in Europe and where Europe has led. I think other countries will have followed, especially on GDPR. We are getting good noises from the from from the US. Uh, I think the UK will actually try and because of the politics of it all, outgun the EU on this front. Uh, that's my wish. Um, and uh, we've been talking to policymakers here. Uh, you know, in the in the UK, we've been subsumed obviously by Brexit and coronavirus. Um, but I think they're getting their their ducks in a, in a row. So that would be really interesting if the UK decides to go even further than the EU. <laughs> 
And, uh, and India, I think, you know, has a natural resonance to this kind of, uh, this model, right? Uh, of kind of grassroots corporativism. Um, it's built into the, to the country's, uh, I think, economic history uh, in the last hundred years. And, uh, and it's also a democratic country. I, I don't know where China will go with it, but who knows? So coming back to data union, I mean, I have a practical question. Maybe you can tell me whether it makes sense. So can I really choose um, who to sell my data to? And if I sell it, how can I be assured that it's uh, the end user or really how do I know that it doesn't, uh, can it basically be acquired? Can a data union sort of be acquired? Again, beautiful questions both. So the first question is um, about member preferences. At the moment, we don't have a way, in a technological way of, of signaling the preferences built. But it's, it's actually not that difficult to build that in, right? So people basically say at the start, look, these are the kinds of organizations I'm interested in selling to. If you're sort of the, the kind of person who wants to make every single decision about how their data is sold, don't sell your data. Because you want someone, most people are like, I just want you as a body to do this for me. Good news. The EU scheme is based on this fiduciary model. So it says if you are a data cooperative, you have to have a legal duty of care to your members. And that's where the safeguards come in, right? Once you have that, then they have to work for their members in this way and they can't just disregard them. Um, that also brings me to this, the second point, but we'll, we'll, we'll build in these preferences. So you'll be able to, at some point, um, we're not quite there yet with the stack, but at some point you'll be able to say, I only want to sell to charities. I only want to sell to charities and university researchers. I'm happy to sell to everyone, right? And you'll just be in a different bucket of data and only those buckets will be able to be bought by certain types of bias, right? It's actually pretty easy, but we'll, we'll get there. The second question <clears throat> was, uh, I think, follows on from that fiduciary stuff, which is, can you be bought out? Like, what's the point of building all of this stuff if one day Google says, ah, we'll just buy you all out? That is a problem. Obviously, that haunts a lot of people, but certainly haunted me. <clears throat> and I would love to see, you can't force data union operators, these people who come along as entrepreneurs, to be cooperatives, but I would like a federation of cooperatives. That would be really cool. But if that doesn't work, then the fiduciary aspect, that, that thing of that legal duty of care, will probably make it really easy for, or really difficult for Google to purchase, right? Because it'll have to be under the law, it'd have to be a separate legal entity. They can't really talk and they have to work for the members, right? And does Google really want to do that, right? Oh yeah, we've got access to the debt, or they could just buy it to shut it down. And people kind of know that, and that's possible. Um, the token model also helps, right? Because the whole point of tokens really is that you can um, disassociate equity and ownership um, of an underlying capital asset from utility and value. And if you can do that, so you can turn revenues to people and then not have to sell out your equity to anyone, and that, that also helps with the cooperative stuff, but it is difficult. All of this stuff is stuff that we need to think about. And I know why that keeps me, that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> so it's work in progress still. Yeah. It's a little bit work in progress. I think we'll get there. And uh, I mean, there are other technological, so I was just having a chat with one of the original founders, uh, Oren McMillan. I hope he doesn't mind me revealing this. Yeah, he won't. Um, uh, of, of the DAO, uh, like the DAO, like the 2015 thing. Uh, that went horribly wrong. <laughs> was it 2016? He was saying, look, you know, also there's these interesting technological um, things you can build in, right? So uh, safeguards, um, where you have the data union directing as a whole through preferences to one ENS address, and which is then the organization that sells the data. And if, uh, if then you could end up with a situation where the data union just decides to vote en masse to flick to another uh, direct you know, another organization that actually sells the data. So, you know, you don't end up with this networking issue where people go, oh, we've been bought out by Google. I guess I'll leave. And everyone tries to leave as individuals and it doesn't really work, right? But you just have one vote, everyone decides to leave and the whole thing's directed to something else. So nothing has to change. No one has to do anything except for press one button. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, I, I, I do believe uh, data DAOs are going to be, I don't know if huge, but... 
um, they're essential. It seems like it's one of the like blockchain pieces that definitely makes sense to me. And on that topic, um, I was wondering if you've ever asked yourself now being involved in the blockchain space, like why blockchain and data, like why does it even make sense? Uh, it doesn't. And so we don't do it. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> um, where it makes sense is just for the payments. Don't put data on the blockchain. It's just like the worst way to structure data architecture. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why do you want to put it on thousands of databases when even one is already difficult enough? Uh, it's basically the short version of so, it. So, uh, yeah, of course, so, like putting data itself on on at least like current generation blockchains doesn't make sense. There's like IPFS, Filecoin, Arweave. They're, they're viable solutions for decentralized storage. But yes, but there's payments, there's governance, there's the marketplace side. So, right. uh, like, so you use blockchain for what it's good at, exactly. uh, which is, which is all the things you've just listed. So the, the payment, so, I mean, I have been asked this question before, like, you know, why couldn't we, why don't you do this with fiat? Right. Um, and the answer is really simple. Your bank, your business, if you've ever done business banking before, they charge you for transactions, right? 20 cents. That's how they make the money. Uh, and imagine now trying to pay a million people 25 cents. <laughs> and then getting charged 20 cents for each transaction. So that isn't going to work. You can't do micropayments through the fiat system. And you can barely do it with Ethereum. In fact, you can't do it with Ethereum now. Um, so you, you, even then, you, know, you still struggle. Um, so, you know, you, you, Stream is now using Matic. Uh, oh, sorry, XDAI uh, at the back end. And um, uh, Matic was in consideration, but, you know, bridging and stuff like that. So technicalities there. But um, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, we're using XDAI as a, as a side chain for all of this. And, um, and for payment, do you, do, can people use stable coins or like coins that are pegged to USD? Uh, yeah, they can. In, in effect, you can architect this in any way that you want, right? Which is that you could pay all of these people uh, in stable coin. And that might make sense for a lot of people. Uh, but early adopters seem to like the fact that it's crypto, they're getting a token that can go up and down in value. Interesting. Um, it makes the ride a bit more exciting for them. And yeah. And in a bull run, obviously, that's great. Uh, less so in crypto winter. It's kind of like if... Uh, warning. If you were an advertiser back in like 2005 and you got paid in Google stock, that would be quite interesting. Uh, it would be. Uh, <laughs> and I know people who uh, who have been paid in Apple stock. Uh, really? In, from the 80s, yeah. No shit. Uh, and apparently still have it. I don't <laughs> understand because <laughs> I still picked up the tab for dinner. <laughs> God. <laughs> that's how, the, that's, I think, how rich people stay rich, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so another, uh, I mean, we briefly talked about this, but like another use case for blockchain and data would be decentralized governance of data unions and data itself. And um, th it does seem to make sense on the surface, but like if, if you have actually observed uh, how DAOs work or don't work in the Ethereum space, most people don't give a fuck. Like they don't really care to like vote on a thousand random things. And, yeah. and that's even like for money, like where, where they have real skin in the game, like tens of thousands of dollars, they don't vote, they don't have time. So it would be crazy to expect millions of people to vote on millions of decisions for their data. So, so then, you know, the data union starts to, you know, really make sense. Yeah, right. I think you'll, you'll never have pure DAOs uh, and, and that's difficult to say because you're like, oh, I don't want to say it, but I think that's true. Uh, I think you always need, uh, and it's not, it's a really fascinating, like, again, if you look at the kind of economic history of capitalism, it's a really fascinating moment. It wasn't obvious that you could actually give control of your assets to someone else, right? And then also they wouldn't be fully liable for that, and nor would you. Right, so you have limited liability, but an uh, an executor, right, of 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 someone who can carry out the control, and and you can give uh, permission to. So this is like a fascinating construct. It's not actually that. Uh, it's pretty new innovation. Right? It's you know four five hundred years old kind of thing, or even less by other uh, uh, by other measurements. So. Uh, it, I like the, the the DAO, and actually, that's what's being kicked around at the moment. Uh, if you want to know the kind of inside baseball stuff on the legislation, it's like who can you have delegated authority? 
And how far does that go for data union members? And how much does that need to be written into the legislation? Yeah. Right? Because as soon as you delegate, because it's unchained, you could easily trade that right to delegation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it can be tokenized. You could literally have NFTs that if you hold the NFT, you have uh, governance rights over a certain data union or just data set. God, you know, actually, I didn't even think about that uh, properly. Uh, <laughs> what if you start tokenizing the delegated rights? Um, the, the delegated rights that they're talking about are obviously off-chain, right? So the the kind of, you know, Web2 legal structures. Could also be on-chain, like if you use RVIV and things like yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, you're right. Uh, the, the, that becomes a nightmare. It's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and <so. laughs> and uh, what's interesting is you could have limited editions of those access tokens and you could even like have a bonding curve for like the first token gets yeah. 10 days uh first like access to data and then the second token gets it after 10 days and the third one gets it after a month and then the value goes down. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I mean, sort of know uh, the colony guys and one of their great innovations in, in ideas, they haven't quite put it into practice yet, was kind of um, uh, rights at decay right. over time, Yeah. right? And I was like, yes, that's it. That's the secret source. Um, but I think they're, they're coming out soon with their, their, their second more viable version. Uh, and I hope that the decaying rights is in there because uh, that's an idea that everyone needs to copy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you're, you're right. You know, it's so, it, it, I think the inherent part is the thing that you said earlier. People want convenience, right? Yes, they want value and they want to get paid, but they also want convenience and they don't want this to take up the, I don't want it to take up people's lives, right? Um, because uh, otherwise that's just failed, right? If I have to keep coming back to you every six minutes with a question that you have to answer, that's never going to work. So, you know, at most once a month. The, the only thing you want to see is the, the number go up. You want to see on your app that, oh, today I have two cents or like $2 more without doing any work. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and, and, and there's some innovations there, which, you know, you get $2 from one data union, but you know, join five and suddenly it's, it's $10. Um, and, and things get kind of more interesting with then, you know, building up those assets of passive income. Uh, maybe that starts to unlock other micro economies because you're now giving lots of ordinary people, right. Who don't have to do anything, who don't have to go and buy crypto to start with. You're just giving it to them because they're already doing work that is valuable. Uh, and they've got now you've opened up the crypto economy to potentially, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of other people who can maybe trade. But more interestingly, again, like, you know, what's, what's the thing that you can solve with micropayments, right? And this comes back to me being a journalist again. I'm like, <sighs> paying for articles. <laughs> Finally, I, I don't want to subscribe to 15 different newspapers, but I do want to read articles from 15 different outlets, right. like regularly. Um, but I only want to pay like eight cents each. Great. I've got some crypto in my, on my computer. It's just there in my MetaMask wallet from the several data unions I've joined. Now you can see this wonderful circular economy, right? Yeah. Suddenly everything makes sense. <laughs> Great. <It's> sold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But why is media actually not adopting that model? What's, what's really stopping them? like the micropayments, it's like you've been there and th I'm sure this is the idea you've proposed within the community also. So what do you hear? The what's, so micropayments, I remember in 2010 were like gonna be the great savior of media. There have been very, yeah. there have been a few ideas. You sit in a newsroom, you know, your job depends on like the business model working, right? <laughs> and especially if you're an investigative journalist, because the most expensive like operation in the, in the newsroom usually. So, you know, it was video, one point video is a great savior. That turned out to be true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, and there'd be other emanations. But um, and now it's just like Facebook will pay us or Google. Like, uh, you know, it's, this is, that's a terrible business. It's not a business model at all. Uh, and then uh, subscribers have, in fact, worked uh, to an extent. Um, but but micropayments are, are, the, are the most beautiful solution. And the reason why it's just technologically, one, really difficult to implement. So you have to use crypto and crypto's only just got literally within the last, I think, six months to the point of maturity where it could handle that kind of thing with side chains. That's the first thing. Um, and you'd have to like encrypt the content and decrypt it, right? So that's, that's the kind of thing you'd have to do, which is sort of what they do anyway, right? They kind of just block it out. And like, if you want to read more, yeah, you have to do these other things, right? Um, 
so I think we, I think we're there. And the second bit is also just, you need a third party to be able to come and get galvanize groups of people who really don't like cooperating all that much with each other because they're natural competitors. Um, uh, and I think, and the third bit is that how do you then get all these, the same crypto token to all these different other people without it, you know, it, that's really hard. And so this is a way of doing that, right? You're like, oh, these people already do work so we can pay them the value for that thing. And then they can use that if they want to unlock value somewhere else. That's just how economies work, right? Um, and maybe that goes to your other question that you asked right at the beginning as well. Like, you know, what are the other ideas that this starts to unlock? Well, you know, there's these, these huge parts of our lives that um, for good or for worse, but usually for worse, because they disempower people, aren't counted as economic activities, right? Because no one actually has a way of either paying people or counting it, right? So the, the typical example is usually all of domestic work. It's not counted in, a, in economic terms because no one's, no one's paying, vastly, generally speaking, women to do any of this stuff. Um, and so it's also disregarded and counted as second class, right? Well, this is another aspect of that, right? With the, with, 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 uh, the data economy. Um, and suddenly when you start to unlock that stuff, then you start to see uh, vast improvements and vast empowerment uh, of all sorts of sectors of society that were just ignored before. Yeah, agreed. I, I, I do really feel like data could be the gateway drug for crypto, for empowering the, the next billions of people to start monetizing everything. Like with the recent NFT wave in the crypto space, we saw now there's a whole kind of silent uh, economy of digital artists who couldn't capture any value and now they're doing it. And, you know, who knows, maybe in like two or three years, the next crypto summer, winter, <laughs> uh, it will be all about data and data unions. I mean, I, I really hope so. Um, I know we're running out of time, but maybe just to, to say one last thing on that, which is, you know, what has Web3 done to date, right? We've got money, digital money, right? That's Bitcoin. We've got contracts, really important. Um, in with Ethereum. And we've got a way to trade and financialize all of that, right? That's, that's the DEX is. And what do NFTs represent in that schema? Uh, assets, right? Well, you know, what are some other great assets? Well, you know, it's really hard to take a house and put that on the blockchain. It's really, really hard to do that. <laughs> but data is worth trillions and it's already digitally native. But it is stuck in Web 2. And it's begging for scarcity. Right. Yeah. That's the biggest problem with data. It wants to be free, but it also wants to be scarce at the same time. Yeah, there's a huge tension, right, uh, on, on that basis. Um, so, you know, it, data unions are a way of porting all of that Web 2 value into Web 3, right, and assetizing it. As you what Ocean has been doing, right? It's like, that, <laughs> that's why I think great supporters of data unions, because they're like, please bring it in and to our marketplace, obviously. <laughs> Uh, and trade it, right? Turn it into uh, tradable assets and, and financialize it to your heart's content. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating model. All fingers crossed. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I, I should, you know, I didn't also, one last thing to mention, I didn't mention Tap My Data, uh, who, who also, um, they're not uh, building on Streamer as, as such, but, um, you know, there are other data unions that are out there that aren't part of the Streamer ecosystem. And I think that really just proves, you know, like GOGB, um, uh, another one, uh, Tap My Data, which they're all doing brilliant work and they're all data unions effectively. So it isn't just what we're doing. Um, there's a whole ecosystem here, which is exploding because uh, they're seeing the value in, in this model. Hopefully, at least on blockchain, all of them are going to be interoperable. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I, think, I think they will be because they know that it makes sense to, to, to that, that Lego uh, you know, people talked about DeFi Legos. Well, well, data Legos is something that I think Trent from Ocean talks about. And um, uh, and he's right about that one. Like people want to mix and match data sets. Like it's well, great. That's where these things need to be. Yes. Um, with that, I think now is a good time to wrap up. Um, Shiv, do you, by the way, your name is Shivan or Shiv? No, just Shiv. Just Shiv. Um, my parents couldn't be bothered to give me more than one syllable as a first name. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> 
<laughs> it's a shiv. Yeah. Diksha sometimes calls me Nim. So that's, that's my shiv name. It's Nim. <laughs> so uh, what's your Twitter handle or like what's the best place for people to follow you? Um, at Shiv Malik uh, is my Twitter handle. Okay. Pretty simple. Keep it simple. Um, yeah, that's the best place. I'm fairly addicted to Twitter. I'll, I'll, I'll get to your message one day uh, within, within 48 hours. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Diksha, anything from your side? Mm, well, good for now. Okay. But definitely, I think we'll have you again. There's so much to talk about. It would be a real honor um, uh, and, and, and humble to, to be on the podcast and be able to chat. This is, um, I love doing this, you can probably tell. So thanks for, for having me on. Same here. It was an honor. Thanks to everyone for listening to this episode and see you or talk to you in the next one. Bye.